So David Thompson uh, started with the Hudson's Bay Company, uh, and he was recruited at age 14 and stationed at Hudson on the Hudson Bay at the York Factory and several of those other stations. But he had a toboggan turn over on him and broke his leg. And while he was healing up from that leg, he had the opportunity to learn surveying from Philip Turner, who was the official surveyor for Hudson Bay Company. So he became a very accomplished a mathematician, he was very alert, and uh, he grew tired of the complacency of the Hudson's Bay Company. He, was, he had these surveying skills and he had get up and go when he wanted to see places, and Hudson Bay wasn't so interested. So he, he left them, he quit and uh, went to work for the Northwest Company, and immediately they sent him off to explore these trails and the, the big passion became finding that route to the Pacific. So it was David Thompson, really, that mapped this route. And I'll talk about the trail, but what struck me afterwards about the trail is the trail itself is such an abstract concept. And when you walk it, it's a trail that comes from somewhere and goes somewhere. But what really brought it to life to me was the fact that there had been so many people travel that before, there's just such a, a history associated with it. So to try to, con to uh, give another point of reference to the school teachers, we, we thought we'd just talk about a few of the people who had been there. And among the first of the travelers was uh, uh, Gabriel Franchier, <clears throat> who was also a Quebecer, but he went to work for the John, for the Astor uh, John Jacob Abster, who was president and man in charge of the American Fur Company. Well, when David Thompson got down, to, getting ahead of the story here or behind it, I'm not sure which, but David Thompson crossed the Athabasca Pass in the winter of 1810-11. And, and in uh, June of 19, 1811, he found his way down to the mouth of the Columbia and found that he was just four months behind a ship that had landed with John Jacob Abster's people to build a fort at the mouth of the Columbia, which is what he had intended to do himself. And it was, uh, he was disappointed, but he, he came back and continued his mapping and had a tremendous haul of furs when he went back again. But the Northwest Company, by some very clever maneuvering, bought that fort Astoria from the Northwest Company, or from the John Jacob Astor in 19, 1813. And so they invited anybody who wanted to join the Northwest Company who was working there to, to do that. Francher decided he'd had enough and wouldn't join the Northwest Company. So he came back east in 1814. They left uh, early in the, I think it was early May, of 1814, and by the time they got up to a boat encampment and started over the pass, the snow was still really deep, and uh, he describes in his, his memoirs and the book he wrote that it was like pulling on rubber boots when they walked. He would, he would like, whoops, <laughs> take a giant step and then sink down to his hips, and then he'd have to pull it out of the other socket. It was very descriptive coming over this deep snow in uh, early May. So they, they, but they got through uh, this party of uh, 24 people and headed down from uh, Jasper House by canoe down the Athabasca. And at the mouth of the Old Man River, there's a rapids in there and uh, they lost two of their party in there, and it pointed out early that it, that this road wasn't without its without, wasn't without its hazards. The next guy that came back of note was a fellow named Ross Cox, who did join the Northwest Company and finished out his term, and uh, returned at the uh, end of May, 1817. So interestingly, we got this picture this photograph or this painting from a great, great, great grandson of Ross Cox. And he said he was the end of the line, that he had, there was no other Coxes in his line that uh, 
So as, as, uh, so when he was gone, that was the end of it. So he gave this portrait to Tom Peterson to keep in the Jasper archives. It was interesting to hear from an ancestor. But this uh, fellow Cox coming late, it was late in the season, and it was very high water, so the Columbia was full, and by the time they got to a boat encampment, some of the crew were just completely wiped. Uh, two of them were quite ill, and three others were really uh, quite uh, exhausted. So they sent those five men back by boat from boat encampment to go back down the Columbia, and they hit rapids on the way back and overturned and lost all their supplies, and only one survived out of that group. So Cox, in the meantime, and the remainder of them came down off Athabasca Pass into the Athabasca, and they stayed on the north side of the, or south side of the river, as you can see here by Rocky River. When they got down to Rosh Miet and the, what we call today Disaster Point, the water was up so high and running full force into that syncline ridge that they had to climb up over that syncline ridge as shown in here. That, uh, it's a grueling climb up there, but there was no way that they could get around on the, on the river. So he was the one that pioneered that disaster point route that was used in times of high water. And then George Simpson, uh, whose name would be familiar to you all, was appointed. Uh, there was a forced merger of the Hudson Bay Company and Northwest Company after years of antagonism and fighting in 1821, and George Simpson of the Hudson Bay Company was named governor, and then later he became governor of the whole <coughs> Hudson Bay operations in uh, North America. So in 1824, he made his trip over Athabasca Pass, and as he was started at York Factory, and, and Simpson was a hard-driving guy. He was, he was a, clearly an alpha male, hard driver, focused, and he had the best and strongest canoeists, and when he traveled, he traveled in style. He even had uh, Colin Fraser as a piper, so it was quite a <laughs> sensation when Simpson's party arrived at a trading post with the piper playing and uh, him and his finery uh, charging up. In fact, one of the descriptions from an aboriginal was that, that this guy in the front of the boat was choking a swan to death. <laughs> it was pretty descriptive. So Simpson uh, came through and uh, in, in, in great time, and when he got to Fort uh, George, well, Astoria was renamed really Fort George in 824, he was just ex ex excited. I, I think I've talked to some of you about this already, but reading his journals, you can get the sense of excitement he felt that in only 84 days or 12 weeks, they got all the way from Hudson Bay to the Pacific. And it was just astonishing that they, that they got through with such speed. So he was delighted that company dispatches could get out there so quickly. And from that Pacific base, he envisioned doing trade with uh, China and trading furs for silks and making it pay both ways. Uh, so it was Simpson that, after that great uh, episode, established the, the official route for this uh, Columbia Express. And he changed the route. Uh, he made one change, major change, that instead of going up on the Green Line, which the original one did, up the Beaver River from the, from the Churchill and through Lac La Biche and then down the La Biche River to the Athabasca, Instead of doing that, he decided that they would stick to the, to the, to the Saskatchewan and then build a road, so-called rough trail, through to Fort Assiniboine to make that link. The reason they didn't like the lack of, there was a couple of reasons he disregarded, the, discarded the lack of the Bish Road, and that's just to the chagrin of Tom McCaniel, who was such a, an avid booster of the lack of the Bish role in the fur trade here was that the water was low when he came through and they had to walk through some of the upper beaver and the Labish River and there'd been a fire through there the year before and there was deadfall and char and they had to walk in the mud out there and it was just a, a grueling 
uh, session on a very slow travel in his mind. The other thing that did it was when they when they parted, he was traveling with uh, Roland, who was a factor at Hudson Bay, and they agreed to meet at Fort Assiniboine. And Simpson said he'd wait there for him, knowing that he'd get there first. Well, as it happened, <laughs> he was slowed down so much that Roland not only got to Fort Edmonton, but got to Fort Assiniboine, waited three days, and then came back to Fort Edmonton. So when Simpson arrived at, at Fort Assiniboine and learned about Roland having beat him, that was the end of it. <laughs> he was not a not a, a gracious loser at all. I think that's probably the only race he ever lost. So that established the uh, the route here.